Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Welcome back. My name is Farley Earhart. I'm one of the in-house lawyers here at the Smithsonian, and I'm delighted to moderate today's panel on law and preservation. I want to thank the Colonial Dames for co-hosting this symposium and also for kicking off my uh, interest in preservation. It was an actual Colonial Dame who encouraged me when I was in high school to volunteer as a docent at our house museums in New Orleans. And that was my first introduction to the amazing women preservationists there. And I've been following their examples ever since. Many of our conference speakers have already mentioned the laws that are involved in preservation. This morning alone, I heard about the National Register, historic tax credits, and international efforts to protect buildings. What should be clear to you at this point is that there is not a single law that protects buildings or cultural resources. Rather, we have layers of laws at the state and local level, at the federal level, and the international level. And I'm thrilled that we have experts in each of those levels here with us today who will describe their work. First up will be Dr. Patty Gerstenblith, who's the Distinguished Professor at the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law at the DePaul University College of Law. And Dr. Gerstenblith will describe her work with international conventions and how they protect cultural property. Next will be Ms. Marianne Werkheiser, who is the founding partner of Cultural, Cultural Heritage Partners, which is a firm that provides legal, policy, advocacy, and business strategy services to clients in the cultural heritage arena. Third, we'll have Ms. Emily Eig, who is the founder and president of EHT Traceries Historic Preservation, which provides architectural history and preservation consulting services to its clients. Ms. Eig will describe her work with District of Columbia laws and their intersection with the Section 106 process, which is the federal review process. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Gerstenblith. I wanna begin by thanking Farley for that introduction. And I want to also thank both the Colonial Dames and the Smithsonian Institute for inviting me to be a part of this symposium, which looks to be absolutely wonderful. And I'm glad to see it addressing issues at such um, different levels of government and other levels of, um, sorry, here, I'm just getting a little distracted by the chat. So um, I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna talk about two aspects of um, historic preservation and cultural heritage preservation, uh, both of which are important factors on the, um, both of which are important factors at the international level. I'm sorry here, I'm just getting a little more adjusted and here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk first about the protection of cultural heritage during times of armed conflict. And the second area that I will talk about deals with looting and trafficking in particularly archeological materials that are looted from sites. So the background to the protection of cultural heritage during armed conflict begins actually with the 1863 Lever Code, which was drafted for the US Army during, um, during the Civil War. That laid the groundwork and was the first codification for rules that regulate how armed conflict is conducted and included provisions for protection of museums and art collections. These points were picked up in the early international conventions, the early Hay Conventions of 1899 and 1907 and became codified in a convention of its own dealing with cultural property in the 1954 Hay Convention written of course in the wake of the massive looting and destruction in Europe during the Second World War. There are also two protocols, one also from 1954 and the second protocol from 1999. And these, uh, there are other provisions, particularly in international humanitarian law, which relate to cultural heritage protection, but these are the main provisions that apply. Now, many of you have heard about, okay, this is not, Many of you have probably heard about the Monuments Men, more formally called the Monuments Fine Arts and Archives teams. And some of you may have seen the Monuments Men film. 
This was a group of officers who were assigned during the Second World War, primarily British and American, but also other nationalities, to identify cultural sites, to aid the military in avoiding causing damage or destruction, and also at the end of the war to collect artworks that the Germans had looted from throughout Europe, to collect them and try to return them. But the term monuments men is misleading because in fact, there were several women who were part of the group as well, some of whom were very important, and in my opinion, do not receive the same level of recognition that they deserve. So I wanna mention three. Uh, Ardelia Hall, who worked primarily in the Pacific theater, so all the protection of cultural heritage was not just in Europe, but also in the Pacific theater. And she remained working at the State Department for several years following the, um, following the end of the war. Second, I wanna mention Edith Standen, who worked at the Munich Collecting Point in, um, in Europe as well following the war, and was one of the signer of what, signers of what is known as the Wiesbaden uh, Manifesto, which protested the plans that the United States had, which was to remove artworks from Germany at the end of the war and bring them back to the US. In fact, an exhibit was brought to the US, but due to the pressure of the officers who signed this uh, particular manifesto, the uh, exhibit was not that long and was in fact returned. And the third person I wanna mention who seems to receive even less recognition is Mary Regan, who became a major, uh, was very prominent in the WAC, the Women's uh, Army Corps, and worked at several of the collecting points and also remained on in the military and worked uh, to set up uh, several aspects of military logistics and organization. Following the end of the war, as I said, the Hague Convention was adopted. And in the 1990s, particularly with the drafting and eventual adoption of what's known as the Second Protocol to the Hague Convention, the Blue Shield was adopted as the official symbol for protecting cultural property during armed conflict. We think of it as the equivalent of the Red Cross or Red Crescent. Uh, and we also have an international organization, the Blue Shield International, and a system of national committees. So we have the US Committee of the Blue Shield, which uh, has the goals that are listed here that to coordinate with the military, to promote ratification of the 1954 convention and the protocols. And I will say that one of our early successes was in 2009 when the United States finally did ratify the convention. Um, it only took 55 years to do so. And finally, to assist in the protection of cultural property, both in armed conflict and natural disaster. And you see an example here of the Blue Shield, what it looks like painted on the roof of the Iraq Museum in 2003, just before the onset of the US invasion. US Committee of the Blue Shield has always been led by women. You see here on the left, Corey Wegner, who was uh, also a major in the army and in the um, civil affairs. And she uh, was a museum professional. She worked in Iraq and other places as part of the US Army. And today she heads the Smithsonian's Cultural Rescue Initiative. Some of you may have heard her earlier today. So she is on the left and she was the founder and the first president of the US Committee of the Blue Shield. The second president is on the right, Nancy Wilkie. Um, and I am honored to follow both of them as the current president of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield. Uh, they are flanking Harry Edinger, who was one of the original Monuments Men at the time that the Monuments Men received the Congressional Gold Medal in 2015. So the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield undertakes several different activities. On the bottom right, you see Corey uh, as she is uh, conducting a uh, educational program for several European military leaders who at the time were on a tour of the US and working with the War College. And on the left, you see an example from the um, no strike list that we have worked to prepare, which is lists of sites that are to be protected, if at all possible, during armed conflict. We also um, worked with both Congressman uh, Ed Royce and Elliot Engel to adopt the Protect and Preserve International Cultural Property Act of 2016, which among other things prevented, and I will return to this topic, but prevented the import into the United States of cultural materials looted from Syria. I also bring this up because they were recipients of the US Committee of the Blue Shields uh, awards, which are given out not every year, but periodically to people who undertake leadership roles in 
protecting and preserving cultural property. And I will say that this legislation also created the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee, which is an interagency group uh, led by the State Department, but coordinating with the Defense Department, the Justice Department, and several other agencies, including the Smithsonian, within the federal government. Last activity I'll mention is that the US Committee helped the Smithsonian, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and actually with funding from the State Department to produce these heritage guides before the US was involved in retaking uh, first Mosul and later Raqqa from the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. Uh, these guides are quite small. They are brief introductions to the law of armed conflict, obligations to protect cultural heritage, and some idea of the heritage that was in each of the respective cities. They were produced in English, Arabic, and Kurdish and distributed not only to the US military, but to the other um, partners with whom the US military was working. The second aspect, as I said, I'm going to mention is the looting of archeological sites. And I will focus, um, although this is a worldwide phenomenon, I will focus on the uh, looting over the last 15 or so years. First in Iraq, you see an aerial view of a site in Southern Iraq where there was looting on a massive scale following the US invasion of 2003. And more recently, looting in uh, Syria, in this case, uh, by the Islamic State all the, or under the aegis of the Islamic State, although looting in Syria was carried on by a wide range of actors. So this is an aerial view of a site in Eastern Syria called Mari. Uh, before the massive looting took place. And now you see indicated the looter's pits with the red circles and other looter's pits that go far off into the distance that you can see uh, going off here. Now, the main international convention to protect uh, or to regulate the international market in cultural materials is the 1970 UNESCO convention. However, international conventions are only binding on states that have ratified them. And in many cases, including the UNESCO Convention, only to the extent that domestic implementing legislation adopts these provisions. So the US uh, statute, the Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act, allows the US to, en to enter into bilateral agreements with other state parties to prevent the import of undocumented archeological and ethnological materials. It also allows the US to impose emergency in import restrictions in certain circumstances. These uh, agreements, we currently have agreements with about 22 countries and emergency restrictions for a few others. You see here some artifacts that were intercepted by US law enforcement from China, from Cambodia, and from El Salvador, uh, countries that we have agreements with, and these are being actually packaged for return to uh, their respective countries. Now, most recently, as I've said, we've had large scale looting from Iraq and Syria. And I'll just mention that uh, ongoing litigation, some of which is settled through a civil forfeiture action, some of which is still ongoing, uh, involve large quantities of artifacts that were acquired by the Hobby Lobby Corporation, and in some cases donated or intended to be donated to the Museum of the Bible. These artifacts, a large group of about 3,500 that were forfeited in 2017, another group of about uh, 8,000, which the museum has acknowledged were uh, probably improperly acquired and will be returned. And on the right, you see a tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is currently still in litigation. But just briefly, these illustrate all three possible ways of violating US law when looted and undocumented archeological materials are imported. First of all, there may be import restrictions under the Cultural Property Implementation Act. Um, and we have emergency import restrictions with Iraq. Um, I'll mention that uh, for five years under the Obama administration, I chaired the committee, the Cultural Property Advisory Committee, that advises the State Department on entering into these bilateral agreements. The second provision is that many foreign countries have vested ownership in archeological materials in the state and something removed in violation of such a law is considered stolen property under US law. Third is that objects may be improperly declared upon import into the United States. And particularly the tablet on the left, which is part of the 2017 forfeitures, uh, were imported with improper statements as to their country of origin, their value, 
uh, and in fact, what they were. So there's a whole host of possible illegal conduct, and we work through various means to try to stem uh, the flow of these objects and to prevent the United States from being a market for illegally acquired and looted archaeological artifacts. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. That was fascinating. And now I will turn it over to Marian. There we go, my PowerPoint. So I'm going to jump in. And uh, if you could go to the next slide. Today, I'm going to share with you a bit about my firm and our practice. And I'm going to tell you a story that illustrates the strengths and the shortcomings of federal preservation law. Next slide. First off, I'm the founder of Cultural Heritage Partners. We have grown from three partners in 2010 to 19 people today, um, and we have an interdisciplinary law practice. So in addition to attorneys, our team includes communications and advocacy professionals. We have archaeologists and cultural resource specialists, um, art historians, and tribal specialists. So our practice spans the full range of matters concerning cultural heritage and always with an eye to further developing the law in this field. My charge today is to talk to you about federal preservation law, and I'm gonna start with a story of one of our key matters, which is representing the Monacan Indian Nation in their fight to save their historic capital at Rastwick. Next slide. Okay. Many of you know the story of the English at Jamestown, and you likely remember the Disney-fied version of Pocahontas, a daughter of Chief Paladin who saved the English Captain John Smith. Um, what you may not realize is that Captain John Smith led exploratory trips throughout Virginia and produced a map of Virginia in 1612. Um, if you look at this picture right here, you'll see that the Paladin chieftain was in the very eastern part near the ocean, You've got Monacans in the middle of the state, Saponi to the south, um, and then you move further west into uh, Cherokee territory. So during his travels, John Smith was accompanied by a Monacan man named Amarolic. And Amarolic had been wounded in battle and taken captive by the English. Whereas the tribes of Paladin um, willingly traded with the English, um, they actively helped them survive the starving time the Monacans avoided contact with them, and Amarolic explained to John Smith that the arrival of the English had been anticipated. And he explained to him that, quote, we have heard that you were a people from under the world to take our world from us. Next slide. So in 1612, when John Smith drew his map of Virginia, he recorded an Indian town at the fork of the Ravana and the James Rivers called Raswick. Smith learned that Raswick was the capital of the Monacan people. All Monacan towns sent their tribute to Raswick and they would gather there for major ceremonies. It was called the chiefest town. Raswick was a large town. It had a long house of about 60 feet um, and at least a dozen round houses. A carbon dated feature at Rasawek indicates occupation as early as 5,340 years ago, about 200 generations before John Smith. All right, next slide. Okay. So here you'll see um, where Rasawek is on that map. And it's at a spot where two rivers meet and is now known as Point of Forks. Um, it's one of the most concentrated archaeological districts in Virginia. And in fact, the Smithsonian sent two delegations of scientists in the 1870s and again in the 1930s to document archaeology and Indian burials at Raswick. Um, Raswick provides the Monacans with a tangible connection to their ancestors, the vast majority of whom did not survive the arrival of the English, and many of them are buried here at Raswick. The Monacan's ancestors lived, died there, performed rituals, met as a community, and the artifacts that they left behind reveal important stories to Native and non-Native people alike. Next slide. Um, just to orient you guys a little bit more to the geography of Virginia, 
The yellow star here is where Rathwick is. It's um, right now it's close to Columbia, Virginia. It's right where the James and the Ravana meet. Next slide. Here's a, an artist's rendering of what Rathwick might have looked like. Um, and the next slide also shows um, what it may have looked like. They certainly um, had crops planted there. They were conducting active trade all up and down the rivers in Virginia. And then next slide, here's an aerial shot uh, right now where the rivers come together. So you can see that this is actually a point of land, a uh, point of forks. So despite repeat, uh, next slide. Despite repeated warnings about the importance of Raswack from historians, tribal leaders, and concerned citizens, the James River Water Authority, which is a, a governmental body, plans to destroy the nation's pre-colonial capital and their burial grounds to build a water pumping facility. And this is a picture of what the pump station would look like. They want to pull water out of the James River, pump it into a water pipeline, and then send it to a treatment plant that they've already built across the river. Um, it's important to understand that this plan is completely unnecessary. Uh, the Water Authority admits that there are alternative locations for the pump station that would still meet the water and sewer demands of the community. And their only explanation for choosing this location is that they think that um, it would save them money over other alternatives that don't erase irreplaceable Indian heritage. Um, of course, the Monacans are deeply troubled <laughs> that the Water Authority would disturb their ancestors' resting places. Um, when Indian burials are dug up by contractors, what usually happens is that they are returned to the nation, if at all, in cardboard banker's boxes. Um, the Monacans have had to go through a number of very traumatic reburial processes, and they do not want to do that again. Um, they believe their ancestors deserve to rest in peace, and um, their living community doesn't deserve to have to go through that trauma, um, especially when there are alternatives available. Next slide. So now let's talk about how the law can help. Um, our client is the Monacan Indian Nation, which is the largest federally recognized tribe in Virginia. Scholars have estimated that about 15,000 Monacans were living at the time of European contact. Today, they have about 2,500 enrolled citizens. Next slide. Um, they have fought valiantly to keep their culture alive for more than 400 years of systematic oppression and attempted erasure at the hands of the government. Um, after many, many hard years of fighting, in 2018, Congress finally recognized the Monacan Indian Nation as a sovereign government, and federally recognized tribes have a special political status and enhanced rights to consult with the federal government when the government is going to take actions that affect them. And one of those actions is a, um, has to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act. So the National Historic Preservation Act requires the federal government to take into account the adverse effects of its actions to historic places. What that means here is that before the Army Corps of Engineers, a federal agency, can issue a permit to the Water Authority to build their project, they have to identify any historic properties that will be affected. They have to assess what adverse effects may occur, and then they have to seek to resolve those effects. Um, they must consult with federally recognized uh, tribes and the public as part of this process, um, which we give the super exciting name, the Section 106 process. Um, the ultimate result of the Section 106 process is not determined by law. This is not a substantive statute. It's a process statute. Um, so the agency has to seek to resolve adverse effects through consensus with historic preservation offices, but there's no no formula for how that happens. Um, and in this case, the tribe has argued that there's no way to mitigate this. You have to move it. Next slide. Um, so in this case, we have a historic property affected, Raswick, and the tribe strenuously objects. The Monacans have mounted a legal, political, and public relations effort to do everything in their power to force the Water Authority to move the project. 
And here we have tribal elder uh, Vicki Ferguson with Governor Ralph Northam visiting the site last summer. Next slide. As part of Section 106, the government has to conduct a survey to identify historic properties that will be affected by the project. In this case, the consultants hired to do that work turned out to be unqualified. They had misrepresented their educational degrees. A brave whistleblower who had been on the archaeological team stepped forward to explain that untrained construction workers had been allowed to use post hole diggers to disturb the most sensitive parts of Raswick. Even um, with this grave malpractice, multiple sites were identified at Raswick that qualify for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And being eligible or listed on the National Register is required to move to the next step of the process. As a result of these terrible revelations and public outcry, um, the Army Corps took a step back from their permitting process and required that the Water Authority submit a more rigorous application, um, which provided an opportunity for new public comments. Next step. So in June of last year, the Corps received more than 12,000 comments from individuals and organizations across the country supporting the Monacan's request that the Water Authority choose an alternative location that would not disturb their ancestors. And late last summer, the National Trust for Historic Preservation named Raswick as one of its 11 most endangered historic places in the U.S. Next slide. Here's the, we got a ton of, of media attention to those 12,000 comments. And next slide, um, I wanted to just show you here some of the organizations who weighed in with the Army Corps to support the Monacans. I think it's really important to note that this is one of the first really big battles that all of the federally recognized tribes in Virginia have come together to wage um, since federal recognition. And it is a way of them um, showing that they have to be consulted now. And as Chief Branham of the Monacans has said to me on many occasions, if we can't save this place, the no place of Native history is safe in Virginia. Next slide, please. Okay, so where do things stand now? The Monacans are working with the Water Authority to explore a preferred alternative. Um, the tribe did a lot of research, talked to local landowners, and identified a route that would move the pump station two miles back from the point and out of the core of Raswick. The Water Authority has agreed to hire a consultant who has the confidence of the tribe, very qualified consultant, to determine whether there are burials along that route. And if there are no burials, then the tribe will work with the Water Authority to get this alternate route permitted. If the Water Authority changes course and decides they're going to dig their heels in and try to stay at Rasawek, then the tribe is prepared to take the Army Corps to court if they issue a permit for this um, to enforce their rights. In addition, the state would have to issue a burial permit to the developer to disturb those burials. And the Monacans have been advocating to the governor and the State Historic Preservation Office that that burial permit should not be granted. So we still have a ways to go to make sure that Raswick is safe, um, but we're somewhat hopeful about this alternative. Next step. Next slide. Thank you. So real quickly, some lessons from all of this. The National Historic Preservation Act and its consultation requirements um, are a very important tool for preservation, but it works best when it happens at the very beginning of project planning. That's when conflicts could have been avoided. In this case, the Water Authority purchased the, the property where they want to build the pump station years before they ever reached out to the tribe. And I truly believe if they had had these conversations sooner, a lot of this could have been avoided. Um, another good lesson is that in addition to legal advocacy, and believe me, we've done a, a ton of legal advocacy in the regulatory process, you also need to bring political relationships, public advocacy, and community engagement to the table. 
Um, you need to show the regulators that the public cares about these places. And then if they make a decision to allow them to be destroyed, there's going to be political consequences for them. Um, and then finally, to shape the law, which is really what we're doing here with this case, um, you need to pick your battles. So you'll remember, you know, the civil rights movement didn't succeed by taking every case. As a lawyer, you need to have a really good set of facts, but you also really need a compelling story. And I really think that the side with the more emotionally compelling story um, is going to win nine times out of ten. And I will uh, wrap up here. We can go to Emily, who's going to talk uh, more about how local preservation law um, can protect our historic places. Good afternoon. How are you all? And thank you to everyone who's spoken. It's a very interesting, very interesting uh, symposium, and I'm very happy to be part of it. And I hope that I can um, help you understand a little bit of how DC's preservation laws work, but also how the federal and local laws intersect. So um, ESG Tracers is a woman-owned preservation firm. We've been around since um, in various forms since 1977, and have worked all around the country in dealing with different federal and local laws. So the next slide. So I wanted to start with talk about DC. And the preservation movement in Washington, DC started way, way back. There were lists of landmarks that would come out on holidays that would be published in the paper. But in 1964, the um, DC, which is was a municipality essentially that was controlled by the District of Columbia, I mean by the federal government, passed a regulation for the Joint Committee on Landmarks that identified landmarks in the city in 1964, two years before the National Historic Preservation Act was passed. In 1978, when Home Rule went into effect, that law was um, further cemented and very clearly established both criteria for designation and criteria for control of review of the uh, you know buildings that would be altered or demolished. Before that, there was some discussion of alterations, but no demolition. And that is where we really come to a difference between local and feds. Let's go to the next slide. Is that the local designation actually has more teeth than the federal designation. The section 106, while very, very useful and can be very strong in changing opinion and delaying process and sort of helping people to make the right decisions, is not as strong as in District of Columbia, the preservation law that says you cannot do something if you are violating the law. Now, it is not exactly the same as I, as I said, but the criteria for the designation is even different. The criteria for DC is similar to the National Register, but not the same. And the DC Preservation Review Board does not have to follow the Secretary of Interior standards when it makes decisions about alterations, nor does it have to follow exactly the National Register of Historic Places. This is particularly different in terms of the level of integrity. That 50-year rule doesn't apply in DC. It's only sufficient time has passed. So it gives us a little more freedom and a protection than we might have otherwise. The um, interesting situation is some, sometimes there are buildings that are on the DC inventory, they're not on the register, and there are a few that are on the register that are not on DC. And that is something that the city's been trying to correct for quite a while. Go to the next slide. So what kind of properties are protected under the DC Act? Well, we protect the same types of properties as the National Register does, which is buildings, sites, like archeological sites, objects, and districts. The big difference here is that a district, if it's designated in DC, does not have protection until such time as that designation is forwarded to the National Register for its consideration. It does not have to be listed but has to be forwarded. And for many years, our downtown historic district had no protection because it was not forwarded to the National Register. That has since been corrected and there is now a lot of protection in downtown DC. 
But we have, um, as a result of the hard work in DC, over 70 historic districts, and that includes neighborhoods, it includes government and institutional complexes, and parks and parkway. For instance, the canal is a national park, and it is actually also protected as a historic district within the District of Columbia. So we have, in 2009, which we are talking now almost 10, more than 10 years later, we had over 700 designations, we're probably close to 1,000 now, and over 25,000 properties were protected, which is probably closer to 35,000 now, which is a very intense number compared to the number of buildings we have in our city. But the belief in, pre in preservation and the protection of the character of, historic, of District of Columbia is very strong. So next slide. Well, you would think that's all great. We have this nice DC law and you know, the feds are over here and DC's over here and everything's nice, except District of Columbia is not a state. It's a city state, I like to refer to it as. And the federal government gets involved so much, it's kind of surprising, in fact. The different agencies that get involved, the Commission of Fine Arts, National Capital Planning Commission, and then the Advisory Council, because the Section 106 affects locally designated properties that are on the register, even when there is no federal involvement or any kind of action that you would think would require Section 106, but it does. The um, Commission of Fine Arts participates both as a reviewer of federal buildings, but also as a reviewer of buildings that are within what's called the Shipstead Loose Act boundaries. And this map on the left shows you the boundaries that are areas that are adjacent to historic properties like Rock Creek Park and or the uh, monumental core of the city. So anything that is within that area reviewed regardless of who is the owner. But that includes the District of Columbia as well as private citizens. National Capital Planning Commission has a central core that they protect buildings that are owned by the District of Columbia within that central core. And they are, as a federal agency, required to do a Section 106 review of any action, therefore, that the district takes. So their act is federal and district coming together. And the Advisory Council obviously gets involved because of that. So the next slide. So I thought I'd give you some case studies. The first is a situation where the land and the buildings were actually given to the American Red Cross, a private organization, back in 1913, and then was the original on the top, and then the DC chapter building in 1947. Once again, the land and the buildings, they, they gave them the money to actually design a building and build it and occupy it but it is still federally owned. So any changes that take place have to fall under section 106. Because even though the organization is private and runs it, operates it, maintains it as if it was their own building, it's not their building. The DC chapter came into a very interesting situation because they, um, it's not the, the headquarters as the building on top, but just the DC chapter. And they wanted to raise some money so they could support their efforts. And they decided that they would actually build an addition onto their building. Well, that required them to do Section 106. And what was interesting is because they're not part of a federal agency, they're a private organization, but with federal ownership, nobody wanted to take responsibility for the Section 106. The National Capital Planning Commission, which had to do 106 because they were going to approve and license this federally owned building's action, and the General Service Administration, which as a federally owned building, actually had theoretical control over the building, argued as to who would take responsibility. And it extended the process for the reviews and approvals by quite a while until such time as GSA agreed to take on the Section 106. And there was a um, mitigation through documentation of a memorandum of agreement and certain things were done to protect the building when the addition was done and other things were allowed in, in compensation for that. So if we turn then to the next slide. Now the Carnegie Library is another situation. Carnegie Library is actually on land that was owned by the federal government, but the building is owned by the District of Columbia because the building was given to the district However, before the building was given to the district, they actually 
leased the building to the Historical Society of Washington. So the building has this very strange, you know, they sell the, essentially sold the lease, but the Historical Society of Washington has control over the building for a, with a 99 year lease. They in turn leased the building to the organization called Events DC, which is the Washington Convention Organization. It's very, you don't need to remember all this stuff, but the point is there's many legal ramifications of all these changes. And then Apple, Apple phones, Apple computers came along and said, we'd really like to rent that building and turn it into a global flagship. The, at first there was like, what? Our beloved library? Of course, the library had been closed for years, had not been functioning as a library and actually was at a party house because the Historical Society had tried to run a museum there, which had failed. And they had were operating out of a small portion of the building and the rest of it was reserved for events to rent it for events, but it was not in that great condition despite Events DC trying to maintain it. But Apple came along and everyone realized that Apple, one, had deep pockets, but also had very deep, good intentions for the building. And they, um, it was agreed that they would rent the building and they rented the building for 10 years with an option for 10 years and then proceeded to undertake or proposed to undertake a major restoration. Well, the building, because it is owned by DC and because it then needed National Capital Planning Commission approval, because it's in the central core, required a section 106. And what did that mean? Well, that meant that everybody and his sister could in fact get involved and speak up their mind about what should happen. When everyone saw what was happening, it was very well received and the building had some changes that were due, but they had been it had been altered several times on the interior, unfortunately, which was which was not something that Apple could completely correct, but they did a lot of, of return to the original appearance. And they also did as mitigation cultural landscape studies of Mount Vernon Square where the library sits and of the arrange the area around the square so that there was a full understanding because the building had already been listed on the National Register. And in the end, the memorandum of agreement, which actually is now taken, it's been open for two years, but there's still things that are being wrapped up. We're about to um, finalize, not the agreement, finalize the terms, the um, completion of the agreement terms. And the uh, Apple will be able to check off that they in fact did everything that they were supposed to do. The building is open now um, since the pandemic, it's been reopened and it is in beautiful shape. And the and say the deep pockets of Apple were spent very wisely. And it's a beautiful gift to the city, as it turned out. The next slide, please. Now, there are situations that are a little more controversial. And one of them is the West Heating Plant. The West Heating Plant was, as it sounds, a heating plant for the federal government. It was built after the um, World War II. It was supposed to be built before World War II to help with the expansion of the government during the war. But it took a long time for them to get their act together. So it was not built until afterwards. And as time went on, it became obvious that it was not needed. And in 2012, Congress pressured the federal government to sell the West Heating Plant. It had had some really disastrous hazardous um, situations where there's green smoke coming out of it. And it had been shut down. And they started a public auction. And finally, it was actually sold to a private group. The group decided that they were going to take the building and turn it into luxury housing. Now, this is a big, think of it as a big envelope around a lot of equipment. That's what this is. It is not a building with floors in it. It is just a big structure that's covering up the equipment that was the heating plant. And the plan to do this to the building was not well regarded. The Preservation League was very upset about it, and they actually called for the... Um, proposal to be stopped. They did everything they could because it was the changes that were proposed were so great that they actually fell into demolition. Now, when the, the building was purchased by the organization, which is called the Georgetown Company, not from Georgetown, D.C., but Georgetown in New York, the Georgetown Company signed a historic covenant, and that is, as did the State Historic Preservation Officer. And that covenant called for the State Historic Preservation Officer to agree to any alteration, restoration, rehabilitation, demolition, or modification 
before it would be approved. But he could not unreasonably deny it. But he was, the State Historic Preservation Officer was not happy with what was being proposed. And he really didn't want it to happen the way it was happening. But a lot of, of work was done to show that the building needed to be overhauled dramatically to a point where it would no longer meet the Secretary of standards. The architect that was um, hired was Sir David Ajay from London, and he um, came up with a design that was very well received by the Georgetown neighborhood, which is kind of a thing that Georgetown's famous for not really liking things that are not keeping everything exactly as it was. So there was, um, but his, his uh, proposal was very well received, but it still called for a lot of demolition. So as a result of that, the uh, project had to address this covenant and the state historic preservation officer was not agreeing to sign to it. So they were at an impasse. They didn't know what to do. So even though it's completely privately owned, this historic covenant that was part of the federal sale to the private government, private aid owner was controlling everything. And the city was not in agreement with the state historic preservation officer. The city was fine with the proposal that was being put forward. So it was really wasn't an impasse. The preservation officer finally agreed that if this project went to the mayor's agent on historic preservation, which would look at the demolition proposal, and if it was approved, it was recommended for him to sign the agreement to allow it to be demolished, he would agree. So I will tell you that story if we next, next slide, is that we had to take this case to the mayor's agent for historic preservation. So what does that mean? Well, in Washington, D.C., if you want to demolish a building, you can't just request from the Historic Preservation Review Board to demolish it. The review board, if you file for a demolition permit, you ask for permission to, you know, from the review board. And they say, if it's a contributing building, we're not going to issue a permit. And if it's not a contributing building, they say, we don't care. We don't have anything to do with it. So they don't really have jurisdiction to say yes or no on demolition. But if it is a contributing building, then they pass it on, they refer it to the mayor's agent on historic preservation because it is the mayor's agent and is literally the agent of the mayor in this case to carry out the responsibilities for the Historic Preservation Act. But the Historic Preservation Hearing Officer, which is you're looking at right now, J. Peter Byrne, he reviews proposed work, demolition, alteration, subdivision, and new construction when there is an appeal of some sort. And it's when a project is considered inconsistent with the purposes of the Preservation Act, that is when the mayor's agent hearing process has to go into effect if they want to proceed. How can they get a fair uh, decision that is saying, yes, you can demolish something? Well, the permit can only be issued if the applicant can show that the project is consistent with the act, the Preservation Act, or show that the project is one of special merit, which would mean that it is of exemplary architecture, it has exemplary, essentially, community planning, exemplary land use planning. And it has to meet those purposes in order to be approved. In this case, the while the um, applicant did not put forward for exemplary architecture, the everyone really thought it was a beautiful design, but the review board had been reluctant because of the level of demolition to, call, to have it called exemplary architecture. But it included turning what had been a coal yard into a public park, and this would be paid for by the developer, building a bridge over Rock Creek that would allow a connection between one side of the Rock Creek National Park and the Canal Park to come together and to pay for a beautiful building at the same time. And so the, as the last part of it was that there was a major contribution to a low-income housing, which helped because this was luxury housing. So they were paying a lot of money for low-income housing and all of these together met several of the requirements for the special merit. And the mayor's agent found that, yes, it should proceed, that it was an excellent project, and that it would be a benefit to the public, and that it met these tests. So the next slide. But what happened is that the Preservation League did not agree. They had fought it at the mayor's agent, and they said, we don't agree, and they took it to court. So once again, it's another layer in DC of getting through the process. They appealed the decision and the decision, however, was upheld by the court, the decision that allowed it to proceed. 
it did add an extra year to the process, making this a very expensive process for developers. But when developers go into Washington, D.C., they quickly learn that it is not a simple process to get through, that they should expect that a building that they are looking at might be landmarked, that a building that is landmarked might be very difficult to demolish because their proposal isn't quite good enough, or they sometimes don't understand that this is real, that it's very serious. And it's why DC is considered to have one of the strongest preservation laws in the city, I'm sorry, in the country, one of the strongest preservation laws in the country, because it makes it very easy to proceed and continue. There's a case with the McMillan sand filtration plant that has been going on for so many years, and there's been three or four different appeals that have gone to court over different aspects of that project. And the project sitting there, even though it has twice gone to the zoning commission and twice gone to the mayor's agent and the city owns the land. So it's a very, um, we have created a very complicated process, but one that protects buildings that should be protected. Though sometimes you get caught in a crossfire to say the least. But I think in the end, the, result is that people can feel comfortable that if something is going to be demolished, it has been thoroughly vetted and it's ready for the protection of a new generation. So at that, I just want to thank you very much for, um, I guess, listening to all of us on this because it's been so interesting to hear the different aspects of preservation internationally, nationally, and then I hope in the district as well. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. There was a follow-up question to, to your presentation that I just wanna um, ask you about. You mentioned a canal and, and a viewer has asked which canal. Sure, it's the, um, the CNO canal that runs through Georgetown and up then up to Cumberland, Maryland. And it is all part of the federal, it's a national park. Thank so, you. You're welcome. I also thought we had some good questions from the audience, which overlapped with the ones oh, I was going to ask you about. So, um, First question was, what career advice do you have for new law graduates hoping to break into this field? Move to DC would be my <laughs> yeah, plenty can, of work. Yeah, that's true. There's plenty of work here. That's the truth. Maybe you could go intern that, that you went to. Patty, would you? Um, so it is a tough question that I get asked very frequently, um, particularly by uh, students who are in law school who are graduating or who recently uh, have graduated. So um, the first thing I would say is try to get a job with Marion's firm. Uh, and if that doesn't work out, uh, that it's actually very difficult, at least at the international level. Historic preservation is the one area where there are, in fact, uh, more jobs. But on the international level, it's very, very difficult or from the perspective of working in museums. So the advice I usually give, which is not always uh, received happily, is to basically find what I call an allied field to work in. And depending on your interests, that can be anything from natural resources and environmental law, uh, which intersect with some of the topic Marion was talking about, or to work in soft IP, such as copyright and trademark. Or if you really want to work on the international scale, um, to do um, either public or private international law, particularly private uh, law dealing with import and export. So those are some of the ideas that um, people yeah. could look into. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, we work with a lot of firms that have pro bono, you know, people who are doing pro bono work because typically the preservationists don't have the, the money to actually pay lawyers because lawyer fees mount up pretty quickly. So that, um, and there are not a lot of lawyers who actually can afford to always do work for free. It just isn't possible. Um, but they often, we are working with lawyers who combine zoning and other aspects of real estate law together. That's what we you know, seem to be with. So they're, a portion of their practice is historic preservation. There are not that many that have a complete historic preservation practice. I was the um, Arnie Sorensen, who was the, um, recently passed away, very incredible man who was the head of Marriott. Actually, I met him early in my career because he was a, um, he helped me on a project. With, he was working at Arnold and Porter of law firm and in pro bono, he did a preservation project. It's like, oh, I know Arnie, I've known him, you know? So, I mean, it, it happens that they'll be, you know, they flit in your life and flit out of your life, but other people we've worked with for a long time. And um, people really understand preservation law is very helpful because the 
you'd be surprised. I, I will say one time I was asked, I was told actually by someone who well should have known better that what does law have to do with preservation anyway? And it's like, that is the foundation of preservation. We might not like to do preservation, but we have to do preservation because the federal government advocates for it and because the, the world advocates for it. And it's because of the legal ramifications. And so it's so important. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to study preservation law and you know, that um, help those people who need help. But I understand it's a tough, it's a tough road. Erin, do you have any advice? I love it. And uh, for me, every single day is fun and uh, never really feels like work. And the advice that I like to give law students is think about what are the problems that you want to solve in the world. There are a lot of problems that we need to work on in cultural heritage law. And are you coming at it from a civil rights perspective? Are you coming at it from a, a museum access standpoint? Are you coming at it from corporate social responsibility standpoint? Um, there's so many different entry points into this field and so many paying clients. I know that a lot of people think there aren't, but there are. It's good, um, it's good. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lot of people who need our help. And so um, I encourage everybody to think about what are the problems that get you so excited that you want to read everything ever written about them. You want to talk to everybody in the world who's, who's thinking about them. Um, and you want to network and meet everybody who is working on those problems. And then after a while, you build up a network and you build up an expertise that nobody else has. And that it can be very, very marketable. So I encourage people to think about um, what their passion is in this space and then go out and claim that niche, make it work. Um, I think that, that we need a lot more folks in this field to really get the law to a level where it can be much more predictable um, and result in much more equitable outcomes for people. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, encourager if folks are interested in the legal field. Yeah. And um, a follow-up question, which will combine several of the questions that have been posted is, how does someone get involved in actually protecting something in their community? What steps might you suggest? Marion, why don't you start off on that one? Wow, there's so many different ways that you can, you can protect them. Um, and in the, the place I usually start is let people know that there's a threat. Um, oftentimes we, um, we wait too long to ring the alarm bell and then the options are, are very constrained. So if there's a place that, in your community that's under threat, um, let your neighbors know, get people excited mm -hmm. about it, get them to weigh in early when there's still a lot of options on the table. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of organizations that advocate for um, communities and don't just think about your historical society. Um, they're very important, but um, there are a lot of um, community organizations that may also care about your site um, who may have uh, additional political capital that can be useful to you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would... Which I would say you should also go to your local government and talk to them and see, if, you know, if you're in a small town or a larger town, larger towns tend to have people who are responsible for that and see what kind of tools they might offer you to use so that you can find out what the law says, because um, it might be your first step that way is to uh, let them know that something's threatened. We certainly know in DC, people call the preservation office all the time that there's a concern and they, as a result, they started um, publishing the applications for a raising of buildings. They're every, every week, they send out a notice of what applications came in so that anyone who's on the email can know that there's an issue and can say, hey, wait a minute, HPO, we know that building. We don't want that demolished because they might not know it, um, but the community does. So the government can be a real, can be helpful. And what about doing that fundamental research to show that the the site, the beloved community yeah. resource meets the standards that will be protected under local or federal law. How does one go about figuring that out? Well, that's, I guess, I mean, 
that depends on where you live and what kind of records are available. That's where the Historical Society can be very useful if they have documents. Um, the Their counties have great historical societies for the most part. Lots of counties do. Um, it's the, um, I mean, Traceries does. We trace history. That's what we do. And we find out what's going on. And we very often are asked to assess what that history means in terms of the um, criteria for evaluation for this in the National Register or the DC inventory or in whatever jurisdiction we're in. And that it's um, the history, it's important to understand that the history can be very interesting, but not meet the standard. And the standard might be much easier to meet than you think, even if it's not as colorful as you might thought. So it goes both ways. And the um, I, I've always I learned very quickly that I never try to read what my clients want the answer to be. I always just say what the answer is in my mind because you never know. And sometimes I've converted them one way <laughs> to actually say something that realized it was that important. And uh, the history tells the story, but it is putting it against that criteria. The um, I would advise if people want or want to know what that means is to to go on to the web and read some National Register nominations. There are documentations that are on there. You can see what others have written about buildings. Maybe they're similar buildings. That's a good way to start as well. If you're looking for a particular kind, a type of building or in your town, whatever, see what's already been listed. And it'll give you an idea if that's possible to list it. Thank you. Patty, we have some questions asking about what are the challenges in your field or, and what opportunities um, do you see on the horizon in the international arena? That's a big question. Um, I think um, I, there are so many different actors uh, on the international level. Uh, even just within the U.S. government. Right. So you can think of the State Department, you can think of Defense Department, you can think of the Justice Department from you know, a law enforcement perspective, Homeland Security, getting all of these actors. You know, that's just within the uh, right. executive branch. Then you've got Congress uh, and the courts, although the courts are, um, despite the fact that there's a case going on right now, the courts are usually somewhat less active than uh, Congress and uh, the federal agencies. So getting them to work together, but also to get them to understand why cultural heritage matters. That's probably the biggest challenge. And in the last several years, particularly with the association of looting of sites in Syria, particularly and to some extent Iraq, with the Islamic State and issues of terrorism and funding of armed conflict, that has been something that has gotten the public's attention. But the harder, you know, you talk about the role of publicity in the media, getting across the message of why does heritage matter? And why does it matter? You know, it's one thing to talk about heritage in the United States, where you can say, oh, here's the building next door, your downtown, even a Native American site, which is not far away. It is harder to get people the public to understand why to care about heritage, whether it's China or Mali or Syria or Iraq or elsewhere, that we in fact need uh, to understand, we need to care. Why should we care? You know, that preserving the world's cultural heritage is something that we all benefit from in terms of gaining knowledge and understanding of the cult different cultures and um, of our own past. But at the same time, arguing that just because it is part of our shared past, uh, which has become one of the latest mantras, it doesn't mean that it is for us to just take when we want to. Um, we've seen that a lot in the past. And I think another challenge is developing, particularly in the museum community, but also in the market more generally, an understanding that there are things that are not for us to take. Um, or there are ways of sharing where heritage is not destroyed or the context from which that heritage comes is not destroyed. So these are very abstract concepts, I think, and getting the public will behind them so that our government, whether it's Congress or the agencies, will um, protect those heritage and uh, protect it for our benefit, but also to protect the benefit of the local communities mm -hmm. 
uh, where the heritage is located uh, is a double message. And it really only works when both of those messages get across. And those are the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I think you asked me also, what are the good parts? Um, I'll say the good parts are a little bit like Marion. Every morning I wake up and I <laughs> never know what's going to be in my email box. Right. But I'll tell you, it's always fascinating. And every day, uh, sometimes hour to hour, it's different things, you know, and it's different parts of the world. Yep. Um, and that's what I love uh, about this field. Erin, how about you? Can you speak to some of the challenges and the, the work that you do? You did you did mention it in the beginning with uh, federal yeah. laws and their weaknesses. I, I think um, to Patty's point, we have to make this relevant for people. And a challenge that um, I know I'm really grappling with, and I know a lot of um, folks in the field are really um, reckoning with, is the lack of diversity in the sites that we recognize okay. here in the United right. States. Mm -hmm. um, if you, I, I pulled up a couple of um, stats to share with you guys. So there are more than 95,000 properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Only 8% are associated with minority communities, tribes, Native Hawaiians or Native Alaskans or LGBTQ people, 8%. Um, and then if you look at National Historic Landmarks, which are um, our, our highest level of historic designation in the country, there are about 2,600 of those sites. Only 3% are associated with women or minority communities. Yeah. So how do you make it relevant for um, all people who have a story to tell if, if we're only recognizing a, a very small section of our past um, in this way. So one of the ways that we are working right now to, to try to um, make some improvements on this is um, we're trying to pass legislation that would recognize underrepresented communities histories. Um, we've had several new grant programs come into being over the last few years. We've worked on the American Civil Rights Grants Program um, getting more funding for underrepresented communities grants and a project that is very near and dear to my heart that our client, the Coalition for American Heritage, has been working on. Um, we want to have the federal government identify and protect African American burial grounds. Um, last Congress, the African American Burial Grounds Network Act passed the Senate. And this year, we are working uh, with bipartisan support in the House and the Senate to reintroduce the bill and hopefully get it passed this year. Yeah. So I think that's a, a real big opportunity. I think also um, with Secretary Holland taking office, um, I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis on tribal traditional cultural properties, which um, are often ignored by federal agencies. And I'm hoping that we can get some more guidance in that area. And um, also, we want to figure out ways to make these issues more accessible to the public. Um, you were talking about, you know, how do you analyze a site for historic listing? How do we make that process such that um, people can readily access it, can get sites that really matter to them nominated, and it doesn't require a $50,000 study um, or hundreds of pages of documentation. How, right. how can we make that work better for everybody? So th those are some of the challenges and opportunities that I see. Yeah, I mean, and I'm gonna add is that when some of the problems related with this is that the level of documentation is different than the documentation that we've seen historically. We're not looking at court cases, we're looking at oral history. And I think we really need to have the people in charge accept that as the basis for determinations and not just be you know, really rigid about what has been, you know, what's the sources for this. And I, I don't mean to be sloppy about it, but I mean just to be more open and to different ways that history is recorded. Thank you. We have a question that's been common across the panels um, that I've seen, and that is, how did you first become interested in, in preservation and cultural heritage? How did you get into your line of work? Take a volunteer, anyone? 
Well, uh, then I'll go in order. I, I, okay, okay Mary, I, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, Patty convinced me that this was an awesome field. Um, I was fortunate enough um, when I was an undergrad to have really wonderful professors who encouraged me to um, not choose between my passion for politics and the law and my passion for archaeology and history. And um, they said, you know, there's one person out there who is a cultural heritage lawyer and you could be like her. And they introduced me to Patty. So um, I think that uh, having great mentors is, is really important in this space. Um, and I'll also share uh, for those for folks who are interested in law school and who are emerging professionals, um, Patty and I worked together a number of years ago to launch the Lawyers Committee for Cultural Heritage Preservation, which is a great networking um, organization for anybody who wants to meet more people in the field and, and get ideas for how to pursue these, these interests. Do you have anything to add to that, Patty? It's a great well, premise. Yeah, I get asked this question, but I usually find that my own experience, which I'm happy to talk about, um, is not terribly relevant um, because um, when I was starting out, if somebody, if I had said to somebody, I want to be a cultural heritage lawyer, um, they would have looked at me like I had lost my mind uh, because it didn't, I mean, it did exist as a field, but it didn't really exist as a field as much within the United States, apart from historic preservation, which has, of course, a much longer history. Mm -hmm. So I started off, as Marion alluded, um, as a PhD uh, in Eastern Mediterranean archaeology, prehistoric archaeology, and worked in that field for uh, several years, both um, as a dirt archaeologist and as um, a professor uh, teaching at the graduate level. But I also got involved in a couple of museum questions involving both forgeries, a large category of artifacts that were mm. forgeries, and unbelievably enough, um, a museum that had a claim uh, where half the statue was in the museum in the United States and the other half was in Jordan. And um, similar to Marion, I said, hmm, maybe this is a way I can combine. I had thought of going to law school earlier. Uh, I can combine law and archaeology. So um, then I went to law school and I ended up teaching. I've taught for uh, virtually my entire career. And I enjoy working with students. I enjoy working with um, students at DePaul, but also students across the country and have mentored many that I've seen gone on to um, all different kinds of careers. So um, I'd like to think I had some part in building the, the, the field, the profession. Uh, I often say I grew up with the field. And, um, and I've had students uh, who worked at the Smithsonian as uh, law interns. So there are many opportunities out there and I have really enjoyed being able to connect the archeological community and the broader um, his, um, heritage community with the legal community. And I see myself as something of a bridge between those two fields. Yeah, you know, for me, I didn't go to law school and I wish I had because I spent a lot of my days <laughs> reading the law and, um, and helping lawyers understand what it means because they, the first time someone came to me and asked me, well, you know, what did it mean? I thought it was a joke or like, you're like wh what's going on? You know, like, don't you understand what this says? And they didn't understand. The lawyer did not have any experience with historic preservation, was clueless as to what it was referring to. And so I have... I think I just naturally gravitated towards that, but but I started out. I was um, I was thinking of going to architecture school, and the I wound up talking to my undergraduate professor, who said, "No, oh, I can't see you behind a drafting board, you know, drawing little details." He didn't think about the computer or what the future would be like, obviously. But he said, "There's this program, and it was called um, Museum Education." And it was intended, it was a brand new program that was designed to, um, to help people understand what museums were presenting. What was the, you know, it was not just for the elite, it was for everyone to understand. And the museum that I wanted to work at was the Museum of Architecture, which didn't exist and did not exist actually until it became the building museum, like many years later. By that time, I was slightly in the track, but that's what I was thinking. I would work in, in um, Museum of Architecture in Washington. And the, but as it turns out, I wound up working, got an internship at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. 
And that internship really shaped the direction that I was going in and, and helped me understand what was going on. Because I had the rare experience I worked, it was a full-time internship for four months and two months I spent at headquarters and two months at the Woodrow Wilson House and Decatur House. No one had ever worked for both before. And they both hated each other because they thought the other party didn't understand what was going on. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait, you know, so I had, I was this bridge. I was, you know, here on this little intern and it was, it really tuned me into a lot of the problems that were going on in, in preservation and, and then, um, you know, helped me work on where I could fit in preservation. And that was, you know, doing the history, doing the research and then watching the law change, because while I was doing this, the preservation law in DC changed, which actually said that we, the review board needed to approve alterations, needed to have a mayor's agent who would approve demolition, and that all of this was changing things dramatically from what it had been like before. So I was very um, aware of what was going on, and I suddenly was being asked to testify at hearings. And before you testify, you better know what's going on because you want to know what the forum is, what the questions are. And that was, um, you know, it was very helpful. My first experience wasn't so great, but, you know, I proceeded particularly because of that. I really wanted to learn what was, you know, what was going on, what were the courts looking at and helping, you know, trying to help Patty and Marion's of the world do a better job into protecting buildings. And so... You know, and then I, you know, I, as it turned out, I mean, I was able, I have many women and men, but mostly women have to say who come through my office and who are working in many different places. And a number of them have gone to law school. I'm very happy to say. Um, and, you know, seen the opportunity to uh, work with entitlements and the like and understand how preservation can be an uh, important part of the community not just the rare thing, but actually it's preservation planning that you plan from the beginning, that it's always part of the, the whole system. So, so I love that. So you each, you each found a niche that you were passionate about and then, and, and grew that into your career. It sounds like a common thread, which is what Marion, you suggested people do. So that's wonderful. Can you all talk a little bit more about um, the interaction between public relations and advocacy and the law? You wanna go for that, Marian? Sure. Um, so we are, we're protecting these places because people care about them, right? Um, at the end of the day, it's not about buildings or, um, archaeological sites. It's about the people who care about them and want to learn about them. And I think that oftentimes when we get in these very technical legal arguments about the regulations or the Secretary of Interior standards, um, it becomes really um, esoteric and divorced from the reality of community engagement. And Ultimately, at the end of the day, decision makers are responsible in our democracy to the people. And so the more that you can get the public engaged in these fights, um, I think the better the outcome, because it shows why we care, who we're saving this for, what we're saving this for. And um, if we miss that public value that's being delivered through preservation, then um, we're kind of missing the whole boat and we're likely to lose that political support the next time around. Um, so I'm always concerned that we'll lose these preservation laws if we're not fighting for them, if we're not, um, if we're not building support in the broader community for keeping these protections in place. And so I think that having a really important, having a lot of media outreach, having a lot of public engagement, is absolutely critical to getting a good result and to keeping the protections that we have. You know, I'm going to say also the internet has changed it things and not all for the good because a lot of bad information gets out there very quickly and people get scared. Historic districts that they're going to take my property away, they're going to make me paint my house every year and it's and people it, they believe what they read on the internet. So we really need to be advocates to counter that and not let the bloggers and the, you know, the chat boxes, whatever, you know, rule when they really don't know what, you know, what the situation is. So that is, uh, it, that's hard. I still don't think we have 
that under control. Obviously, we don't have that under control. So uh, we're not alone in that profession of having that problem, but it is, um, you know, just something that would be good if we could get more active in trying to be on the offensive instead of the defensive in that regard. Uh, I certainly agree with that. I think um, on the international level, um, I said, first of all, it's more difficult to get the attention of the public because uh, it's not something right next mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know whether the, the issues are more complicated or technical. Um, I mean, I find the historic preservation area to certainly be very technical, but it seems to me that so much of the media, even the mainstream media, I'm not talking about what you read don't know from mm -hmm. less recognized sources, often get the law wrong. And it makes our, you know, yeah. it's a real challenge and sometimes the facts mm -hmm. um, that first of all, there's a skewing of interest. So um, Marion was talking about statistics of um, what's on the historic register in the United States. But if you think about the destruction of um, ISIS in Syria, what comes to most people's mind is first and foremost, the site of Palmyra. And secondly, um, other sites, uh, particularly the classical Roman Greek Hellenistic periods, and sometimes some earlier archeological sites. But the vast majority of sites that were destroyed were not the classical period sites that the Western media paid attention to, but rather religious sites, uh, particularly mm. mosques, uh, that were important to the local community there. So there's a disconnect between what we think is important and what may in fact actually be important. So um, the media have a responsibility and I think we all have a responsibility to educate the media um, because this is how we reach the public in many cases, particularly as I said on the international scale. So it's a real challenge to get people to understand, to be active. Nobody, I think it's certainly on the international scale, nobody's gonna vote on a particular issue dealing with international cultural heritage. Um, it would be great if they did for domestic historic preservation. I don't know if that happens or not. Um, there are certainly ways of expressing your interest. And um, to my surprise, the story of the looting of the museum in Baghdad in 2003 is something that really caught the attention of the media. And still people will say to me today, you know, if I meet somebody and I tell them what they do, they'll say, oh, wasn't it terrible how the museum was looted? And I'm like, yeah, that was, you know, 15 years ago or 18 years ago. Um, what's going on now? So the media plays a big role. We have a big responsibility to educate that media and then to try to translate that into public support, um, which may not result in votes per se, but there can certainly be pressure brought on one's um, elected representatives to make this more of an issue. And I, I think the that media role is very important because if the United States goes abroad, you know, through our military or otherwise and contributes to destroying a site, let's say, that will get the media's attention. Um, Corey Wegner always says that her job in the military advising people is she'll say to somebody, um, this may or may not technically violate the law, but do you want to be the person on the front page of the new newspaper <laughs> for having been responsible for bombing some you know, right. historic site? So that's where the media and public opinion play a role. And sometimes I think that's equal. And sometimes I think it's even more important than the role that the law itself mm -hmm. can play. Yeah. No, there's no, I mean, there's, there's no question. People read stuff in the newspaper, they see and they, you know, they respond both negatively and positively. And that's, uh, we have to be cognizant of that. Because, I mean, right now there's a campaign in DC among some of the um, more more respected, um, I guess they're bloggers. I don't know, it's not really, it's their media outputs, you know. And they had a big, they came and testified against a historic district getting designated because they decided there were too many historic districts in Washington, DC. And it was like, what, what, you know, like they had just had this personal personalized this thing and the staff at HBO was very supportive and, but it was very uh, stressful because they 
had done their homework in that case, but they were representing themselves. There, it was like the editor of a newspaper came and testified instead of just written, you know, wrote the editorial. And that that active role was something that um, was new for us to see that happen. But definitely, um, we had to deal with with helping everyone to understand that their perception of what was significant was very different than really what was significant. No. Social media is a opportunity and a challenge for, <laughs> for everyone that we're we're learning yeah. to handle. Hey, Farley, be before we wrap up, um, I, I thought of one other thing I should mention. I saw a bunch of questions about um, how people can get into the field and and access various resources. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, there's a wonderful program it's called Arcus Leadership, A R C U S. Our Arcus Leaders Program, and we developed it in partnership with American Express um, as part of the 50th anniversary of the National Historic Preservation Act, and it's an online curriculum for emerging leaders in historic preservation, and we've had about a 1,000 fellows so far. 45% of them are from underrepresented communities, and um, it'll give you a lot of exposure to advocacy, to law, to um, lots of other kinds of skills that you need to be a really great advocate in this area. That's a great tip. Thanks. And I think that's probably a great place to stop. I'm, I'm looking for Maddie or one of our handlers to tell us if, we're, if we've reached our peak or should keep going. But I think we're close to time. About three minutes, I think. Thank you so much for organizing this. It was fun. Thank you for having us. Thank you all. It's yes. been Great. it's been a pleasure. And I've I thought I knew a little bit about DC law, but boy, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs>